Stay tuned. Coming up, we interview four members of the Sioux Falls, South Dakota Fire Department who experienced a near-miss event when the platform on Truck 7 came in contact with a 33 kV transmission line during a routine truck check at the station. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment as we interview four members of the Sioux Falls, South Dakota Fire Department who experienced a near-miss event when the platform on Truck 7 came in contact with a 33 kV transmission line during a routine truck check at the station. This episode is a flashback to our original episode that was recorded in 2016 before we were doing our episodes on video. So the interview is audio only. All right, so today I have four firefighters from the Sioux Falls Fire Department who had a very, very near miss incident. And uh, they agreed to come onto the show and share their story. And uh, guys, why don't you just start by introducing yourselves and tell, tell the uh, listeners who you are and uh, maybe a little bit about yourselves. Hi, my name is Ryan Cox. I'm a captain here on Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. I've been on the department now for 10 years, just this last month. Uh, when this happened, it uh, happened a day right before my birthday, so I'll never forget that. Just didn't almost make it to my next one. Uh, the other thing, too, that uh, was going on in our, my life right at this time is uh, we actually just lost my mother-in-law to a tragic car accident the uh, month previous, so I had a lot on my mind at this time when this incident happened. Uh, I have three kids. I have a uh, freshman in high school, a seventh grader, and also a fifth grader. So they keep us pretty busy, and uh, we like go to the lake, camp, and just spend a lot of time together as a family. Um, so my name is uh, Tom Reel. Um, I have been with uh, Sioux Falls Fire for 12 years now. Um, I uh, been married for. 17 years. Um, I have six kids. Oldest is four, I have four boys and two girls. Um, my oldest boy uh, has autism. He's 14. And then um, my youngest is two years old. Um, I was the driver who was operating the truck on the day that this happened. Everything was probably going good that day. I don't have anything uh, on the back of my mind that was happening. Me personally, everything was going well. And I guess I'll pass it off now to uh, Firefighter Javen Manigal. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Firefighter Jay McManigal. Uh, I've been on the Sioux Falls Fire Department for coming up on eight years. Um, I've got two kids, a four-year-old and a 19-month-old. And uh, I've been married for uh, 13 years. So it's pretty much me. We do a lot of family stuff. <laughs> together spend a lot of time as a family nice so all right pass it up to john thanks jay hello my name is firefighter john alvey i've been on the department for about five years now uh married with two kids i got a daughter and a son daughter's eight year old uh my son is three uh we got an acreage just recently purchased an acreage so i kind of like being outdoors working in the farm or working on our garden and stuff like that so hmm. what all i got nice okay so the day of this event was january 2nd 2016 somebody pick up the mic and and talk us through how that day was uh was starting out and uh whether you guys had, had any calls yet or what was uh you know what what, what was the setup um to uh, lead us up to the actual near miss event um well up there at station seven as far as uh the entire department goes on saturdays is our uh, our truck inspection weekly maintenance day <laughs> um so we inspect all of our apparatus and our equipment on saturdays up at station seven we also have a maintenance garage attached to that where we have mechanics that work out of there so we have a few extra vehicles that we have to do for our truck inspection, in addition to 
um, the truck that had the incident, Truck 7. Um, we, uh, our shift starts at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, and uh, we pretty much start right away after our 8.30 radio test with uh, checking our equipment. So we have a pretty busy day with doing that. Um, the day in question, uh, January 2nd, I had done two other uh, fire trucks. I'd done one aerial prior to this and then uh, a rescue truck. And then I was going to work on the last one, which is truck seven. So we didn't have any calls that day in the morning. So um, me as the driver, uh, my most, most of my responsibilities are actually checking the apparatus from top to bottom with lights and the tires and uh, checking the, um, all the fluid levels, seeing if there's anything out of the ordinary, anything broken. Why the firefighters basically check most of the equipment that's on the truck, whether it's the power saws or the fan or making sure everything is there, nothing is broken. They check all of our EMS equipment. So basically my responsibility is all the um, normal day-to-day maintenance with the apparatus. And that's what I was doing at the time. Um, I, had, I had taken the truck out of the, out of the apparatus bay, and we have a fuel pump in front of station seven it's about i would say about 30 feet to the south of the building on the actual approach to the station so i had pulled the apparatus out there um and where it's getting fuel and that's one of the things that i don't normally do uh as a a normal day-to-day which kind of got me out of my routine normally i would do that at the end but i decided on this day to do that at the beginning So in doing so, that had set me up to be right under the power lines. So Station 7, just to draw a picture of the station, about a quarter of the end of the approach has got high-tension power lines that run across it. And when I had um, put the uh, apparatus by the power line, by the uh, fuel pumps, I had actually positioned it directly underneath the power lines. When I got out, I made a mental note that they were there and uh, kind of put it in my mind to be almost like a training exercise that I would see that I had some obstructions. I knew that they were there. There is a tree um, also right next to the uh, fuel pump that I would have to go around also. But like I said, in my mind, I chalked it up that I knew they were there. They've been there for a long time. I'll just work around them. No big deal. So I fueled the truck, and then firefighter John Alvey wanted to run the pump with me, and so I decided to run the pump first, which normally I do last, and then set up the ladder. So what we did was we ran the pump through its operations after I got fuel, and then we set up uh, set up the outriggers. Um, normally, uh, on when we do the truck check, I would have the truck closer to the building I wouldn't have it this far out so I decided to leave it um, by the fuel pump instead of moving it we set up the outriggers we pushed it that's at four four outriggers on this truck I set those up and then uh, I had firefighter Alvey at the time helping me do that and when we set it up on the captain side which would be the right side of the apparatus. Put the outriggers out. I noticed uh, on those outriggers, they have a light that flashes to let you know that they're coming out. One of those lights was had been had rusted off. It was on that captain's side, the right side of the apparatus, the rear outrigger. The light was just kind of dangling off. And so we decided to take a look at that a little closer. So... My thought initially was just to clip the wire off on that light, and then Firefighter Alvey thought, well, I'm going to go talk to Captain Cox about that because I'm not sure if that would give us an alarm. Maybe we need to cap that off. So he went inside. I continued to run the truck through its testing. So I raised the ladder. I saw that the power lines were there. I just raised it a little bit, went to the left, so counterclockwise. There was the tree. I raised it up over the tree, 
and then put the ladder towards the fire station, which would now be facing to the north. Then when I got to that position, I raised the ladder all the way up to full extension. As I was lowering the ladder down, there was a little bit of a bounce to the ladder I kind of noticed. And not having been on this truck a lot, I was wondering if that was normal for that or not. When I had set up the outriggers, I had I had uh, set it up where all the four wheels on the back, the, both the axles on the back, I should say, were raised completely off the ground. Um, and normally it's not something that I would do. I would leave it all the way down, but I decided to test the outriggers and see how they were working. So I thought maybe with the bounce it was because I had the outriggers all the way up. I lowered it back down so it was still vertical, but I retracted the ladder all the way back down to the turntable. And it, as soon as I had done that, uh, Captain Ryan Cox and Firefighter Alvy had come out and were looking at the uh, outrigger light. So I stopped and asked them what they thought about the light, what should be done about that. And uh, they were telling me they thought they might clip it off or just cap it off for now. So they were working with that. So I let them continue on. And I continued on with checking of the ladder. What I did, though, in that I could just kind of lost my frame of thought. And I, my plan initially, when I raised the ladder to go around the tree and the lines initially, was to actually go back the way I came and then set the ladder uh, back down. But instead, I was muscle memory took over. I'm used to taking the ladder all the way around 360. And I kept it slightly elevated, I think it was at a 60 degree angle, and I brought it towards uh, the front of the truck, which is where the power lines were, and I had it right over the cab. Well, in that time, um, to finish the truck check, I needed to tilt the cab to check the fluid levels, so I wanted to leave the ladder at elevation, but I didn't want to leave it all the way up there just in case we got a call. So I lower, went to lower the ladder down a little bit, and when I had lowered the ladder down, I totally spaced that those lines were even there, and I basically set the aerial platform right in the wires. If, if you can remember, as you were setting, as you were lowering the ladder, yes. and it touched the power lines, were you looking at the tip of the ladder, or were you looking down at the um, turntable controls? Well, in this instance with this, it, since it's an aerial platform, can't really see through the ladder it's kind of blocks my view with the way the platform is set up mm -hmm. um that's a good question i i'm pretty sure i was looking at the controls at the time because i yeah i i guess i don't remember even noticing or seeing the power lines until i actually put the ladder into them okay when, when i first raised it of course i noticed they were there but when i got across Mm -hmm. And what happened was is that these particular power lines, there was four lower lines that were 32,500 volts, and then there was the upper high power lines that were 120,000 volts. And I had basically turned the ladder so that it was in between both sets of those lines, and I was okay at that point. It's when I went to lower the ladder down so I didn't have it up so high that I actually laid it right into the two lower ones. There was four going across there. I caught the two lower ones that were closest to the station. So there's five lines at different levels of the top ones, but then the four line, lower lines are all basically one across from each other. I hit the two lower ones that were um, closest to the station. Mm -hmm. So when I hit those lines... Um, it took me a little bit to register what was going on because everything was arcing, lights were flashing, and then uh, it was sparking all over. And then before I could even react, the lines just exploded, and then they both came down and had enough tension that they separated themselves. Uh, one or two sets, two of the, the one set of lines. Uh, went on the driver's side of the truck and fell on the grass. And then on the captain's side, those lines came down and landed in the parking lot. And they sparked and popped a couple of times, and then they didn't do anything after that. Um, my first thought initially, once I realized what I had done, 
was a how could I have done something so stupid, and then b I am in so much trouble. I don't know what to do. And my first thought, honestly, wasn't even for my own safety. It was to try to get the ladder out of the lines once I realized what I had done. But my controls were fried, and I couldn't do anything. And like I said, it all happened so fast. By that time, the lines were down. Where was everybody else when this happened? So that's the the, the good part of the story was... After I had talked to Captain Ryan and Firefighter John, they had finished what they were doing, and they went into the station to get something to, else. To get some parts. To get some parts or some tools to fix that. And why they were in there, they decided to wash the floor, right, of the apparatus bay quick. And then so, so they had only been out there like, two minutes prior to me hitting the lines. They had walked inside, were inside the bay. So thankfully, when I hit those lines, they weren't there because after looking at the damage to the truck when it was done, right where they were working on that lights, where that electricity came out and went into the ground. I, I assume that everybody in the station heard this happen. Yes, they did, and I, I can let you. Uh, I can let them tell you firsthand inside. Because for me, everything was outside was loud and exploding, and they were saying that it was really loud for them too. I had went out there. Alvy had come in and gotten me out of the office. I was working on the computer at the time, and I came out to look at the issue with the light. And we just kind of both decided, hey, we'll just cut it off because it was just hanging. It was a uh, part of a rusted uh, piece that. You know, it wasn't holding it up anymore, so we thought we'd just clip it, cap off the electrical line so it didn't short out or anything like that. So we went back in to get the tools. I sent Alvy over to the mechanics side to get the tools for it, and while I was waiting, I just thought I'd just wash the bay out since we had the truck already pulled out. You know, in the winter, we get a lot of uh, gravel, salt, and mud just in our area, so our bay gets a little dirty, and... Uh, I thought I'd just wash that out before he backed the truck back up when he was finished. Uh, Alvy came back over from the maintenance, and I was like, tell him, just give me a second, I'm almost done here. And that's when the explosions, uh, I just couldn't believe how loud it was. And then in our apparatus bay, we have three bays with windows in each of the overhead doors. And you couldn't see outside. It was that bright. And just, you know, everything happening so quickly. First, I thought, was that from the light that we were messing with that uh, sparked or something? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> After the second explosion, I go, that's not from that. So I wasn't too worried about that. But then I, I just couldn't believe it. And the light, the explosions, uh, we have a small door next to the overhead doors. And we started running out to there. And that's... Uh, when we saw Tom on top of the pedestal still, uh, I won't say what he was yelling because it probably wouldn't be appropriate for the show. But, uh, you know, we, I, I thought I was going out to find him dead, like thrown 20 yards from the apparatus smoking, you know, just, you know, that visual went into my mind at that time when I was running out that door. Mm -hmm. But, uh, luckily that's not what happened. And, also, then he too he was asking if you could get down. I'm like, no, uh, I just wanted him to stay there until we made sure that all the lines were off, uh, just to get a grasp of the situation too quickly because everything happened so quickly and it was uh, and it was not expected, you know. And one of the things that Tom didn't really mention too is we just received this truck from another station, you know. When so this was kind of new to us also, so it took us out of our comfort zone a little bit there too. And this is a hundred foot. Uh, bucket truck where we just had a 75 footer before just an aerial and uh, so that you know it just changed some things for us having the new equipment up there and with that station being put where it's at with those power lines it's never been a great place to have an aerial truck not a very you know I don't believe that's the best thing to have you know when you've got aerial trucks operating around power lines all the time and that's just one of the things, too, with the different apparatus, where the truck was placed. You know, you look at all these things now, and, uh, you know, a lot of things stand out a little more now than they did then. But uh, a lot of things have changed, and then also just uh, 
that day, you know, when you're out there looking up in the sun, uh, trying to look around the bucket, and and that's why we've changed some of our SOPs and operating procedures so we, we don't have just one person out there operating that anymore. So, mm-hmm. so um, Tom's up on the platform. The three of you were down on the ground, and you told him to stay up on the platform. Yeah. Yeah, I had him stay on the platform, and we started just looking around and trying to figure out. uh, The truck was still running at this point. Uh, It was also alarming, which we couldn't believe that. And then we were waiting for the truck to possibly start smoking, to start on fire, any of that. And then we saw the lines were no longer touching. Uh, you know, we started walking the area in the, you know, to make sure it wasn't energized. Uh, the other thing too, we noticed is probably 20 yards away next to the building, there was a piece of concrete that had, uh, popped up and we had just been scooping snow the day before. And I'm like, Hey, that wasn't there before. So I walked over to it and what had happened, that electricity had followed the outrigger down right where we were working on that light. It went in a crack that was in the ground, went down into the rebar, traveled all the way over to that other area that was 20 yards away and popped up a piece of concrete about the size of a football. Uh, and then also the lines went down in the grass. Um, you know, Jay McManagle just took a picture from today or the other day showing the lines in the grass where uh, the grass is dead from the heat from the lines that, uh, you know, killed them. So it was... You know, we just tried to take in the situation, see what was going on, and then, of course, I had to call and alert our battalion chief in true fashion, just like with the fire department, and then we get a call, and I had to uh, dispatch another unit to that call because we couldn't, of course, go anywhere. So what's going through everyone's head at this point? I thought Real was dead. Yeah, we, John and I both thought Real was dead when we were running outside to take a look. And uh, and then just at that point, just being, I mean, two minutes earlier, we were standing right where this electricity would have passed right through us and went into the ground. Uh, just the luck that we had gone in to go get that part and that John was waiting another minute for me to finish washing out the bay quickly uh, instead of going right back out. Otherwise, we could have been standing right out there when it happened. And or just going out the door, because like I said, that electricity that traveled 20 yards to the building, uh, you know, you look at some of the other instances where this has happened to other fire departments. They've started their, you know, their buildings on fire also, you know, following it back to the building. But uh, just seeing them up there yelling and that was a huge, huge relief. Uh, then everything else was secondary to that because uh, having to tell somebody, especially like with Tom, you know, with six kids, uh, you know, to be able to keep working in a place where somebody passed away in that manner would have been pretty tough for any of us. What, what do you, what's going through your mind, Tom? I guess at the time it was just the fact of my mind, it was relief, I guess, that I was and a miracle to me that I was okay but at the same time, it was just really humbling because, I, you know, it just made me feel stupid for doing it because I knew that they were there initially. I mean, I, it would have been easier for me if I would have raised the ladder right into the lines and forgot that they were there. Um, instead of I got out, I looked up, okay, I'm close to the lines. I'll use it as a training aid kind of a deal. And then to get distracted for a split second and totally space out that the lines were there. So that was my initial reaction. And then, like I said, relief that I was okay. And then, but at the same time, all I wanted to do was get off the apparatus, even though I knew I had to stay put. You know, you're January 2nd, it's cold out there, and you're in front of everybody, you know, if people would drive by or whatever, you know. And uh, you just kind of want to exit yourself from the from the situation because you feel like, I mean, I know a bird on a wire, you know, but when you actually uh, become that bird on a wire, so to speak, it's just a little, it's weird to know that I'm on the controls the whole time. 
I don't feel anything, nothing. You think your hair would raise up or something, but it didn't do anything. And that was just weird. And just to me, it's just a miracle. And, and then the hardest thing for me that hit home with me was the fact of my crew, the, you know, the two guys that were out there at the time and what a close call it was for those guys, because had they been where they were, it would I would have killed them. And that's, that's the hardest, that's been the hardest lesson learned for this. And I'm very thankful that, that, that didn't happen. So, um, the other thing that was really hard for me is just the fact of the, the equipment. I mean, I know it's equipment can be replaced, but to, to basically ball game or take an entire truck out of service um, and, and knowing that we may never get that truck back, that's also been a tough pill to swallow. And, you know, I, you know, a relatively new driver, been a driver for a little over a year, but you know, I've been a firefighter at this department, another department for 16 years and consider myself pretty safe. And, uh, now to eat humble pie, it's not, it doesn't taste very good. So that's been the hardest part. And it's definitely a blow to, uh, self-confidence to, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, I assume somebody of a rank and authority higher than than uh, Captain Cox showed up on this scene. Yeah, our battalion chief Travis Tom. He mm-hmm. showed up initially. Um, Captain Cox called him, and then he showed up and he positioned himself across the street at the time until uh, the power company could get up there and okay it. Because not exactly sure where the lines were down we the the lines actually go over our 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 entire parking lot and the driveway so he positioned himself across the street and once everything was declared safe um then he came in and touched base with with us to see if we were okay and uh survey the damage and then uh yeah from there um dealt with him and then um the fire chief called me later and uh Battalion Chief Mike Clausen in charge of training. So our Chief Jim Sedaris had called me and concerned about what had happened. And, and uh, yeah, so I have nothing but positive to say about my chain of command because they, really, uh, they really took care of me in this incident, took care of the crew. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, once you got off that turntable and it was just the four of you together, Maybe after everyone else left, what'd you say to each other? Yeah, it was just kind of hugs all around, I guess. Uh, when I first got off the turntable, I went back in the bunk room and just kind of sat by myself for a little bit, and that's when um, everybody was kind of coming up there. And we, uh, Battalion Chief Travis Tom, they had got a hold of. Uh, did you do that? The, the electric company. Yeah. So Captain Cox had got a hold of Excel Energy to come up for the lines make sure that they were safe and to take care of the problem and then um, we had a representative for from Rosenbauer and one of the mechanics uh, come by the station to basically get the truck back basically get the ladder back down and get the outriggers back up so that I didn't have to do that they had came and and, and checked everything out and me I was kind of I went back in the bunk room for a minute and just kind of let the adrenaline flow through a little bit and try to try to regain myself a little bit. And then I came back out and, and, uh, helped with, uh, putting the truck back away. And yeah, I just, I don't know. There was, it, it was tough. It was, uh, <clears throat> a lot of hugs at the same time, unspoken, unspoken language, I guess it's, it's an awkward spot to be in, but at the same time, all thankful that, that we were alive and, and a lot of emotions, so a lot of emotions coming through. So, did you stay on duty the rest of that shift? I did stay on duty. They they gave me the option to go home. Um, I chose to stay. It, had I had I gone through that again, I would have went home for sure. I just uh, you know not in a position. And even even for me, Jay Jay volunteered to drive, and I don't know. I felt like at the time that uh wanted to get back on the horse right away i guess but probably the first 
day like that probably isn't the best time for that. I, I wish I would have went home. Part of my deciding factor for not going home was that my wife and family were out of town. And so I, I would have much rather stayed at the station with my crew having going through this incident instead of going home to an empty house because I sure didn't want to call my wife and tell her this when she's four hours away and have her all worried. And I waited until the next day when she got home to tell her. So that was my kind of reasoning for staying um, at the station. But hindsight, I probably should have, you know, I, I should have probably went home, if not home, somewhere else besides staying on duty just for my own, my own personal feelings. Mm -hmm. So how about the rest of you? I assume everybody stayed on shift. Would you, would, if you had to do it over again, would you, I mean, you, it was as close of a call for, for all of you as it was for Tom. Do you think that the, in, in hindsight that the, that the smart thing would have been to stay on shift or to, or to just clock off? I mean, and, and I'm asking this in the context of, as to whether the rest of the shift where you were, were, you know, mentally, were you all in, you know, as far as, uh, you know, being able to maintain your awareness at, at other incidents or were you kind of shaken to the point where you could say that you weren't, um, you know, maybe 100 percent that day? Uh, I guess with uh, me being the captain, I wanted to be there for my crew to make sure everybody was OK. And uh, like I said, with my wife, she still doesn't understand quite the severity of the uh incident but uh she had just lost her mom just uh actually about a month to the day uh previous to that in a head-on-head -head car accident and her father was still recuperating from the accident also so to put more on her plate and to have her realize how severe the incident could have been uh i chose to stay at work too just to make sure you know the transition uh just getting through the rest of the shift with the rest of the crew, uh, you know, at that point too, we had to switch apparatus, of course, and uh, do some things in the station. So we went right back into uh, being available right away. Uh, so it, we had hours to kind of absorb the situation. And the nice thing is, you know, we're there for each other. So we were talking about what happened, what could have happened, how we were, we were very lucky that it turned out the way it did. Uh, and we had plenty of support from uh, upper management and other staff. Uh, we had people from, you know, other shifts even calling us, making sure that we were okay. Uh, you know, just had a lot of support. We have a very good support system in our department. It's getting big, but it's still small enough to where everybody really knows everyone and cares for everyone. So. I'm glad I stayed at the station because then I would have had to explain more to my wife. Well, that that's a nice transition because each of you have people at home that you're accountable to. So I'd like each of you to share how you how you had this conversation with your family and what did you say to them? Uh, this is Firefighter Elvie here. Uh I don't know if my wife truly realizes how close it was. Uh, they ended up coming up that night. They were just in town for some reason. I can't remember why. Uh, and I kind of explained what happened. And my parents actually stopped by too because my little brother was going home. And they were a little more concerned than my wife. So I don't know if my wife truly understood uh, how close it was. Uh kind of how I brought it up is I told her I said we had a we had an incident at work we're okay uh, and I'll tell you more information later and that was kind of the first text I sent her shortly after it uh, after we kind of got everything settled down I switched trucks and I explained that a power line was hit and how we were working on the outrigger uh, and I yeah so I, I don't know if it truly she realized how close it was. Did you have any follow-up conversation? Uh, I did more with my father uh, because I think he understood it more than mm -hmm. with my wife. Uh, and I try not to bring that home per se uh, 
we have, you know, my wife's a, a bank examiner, so she doesn't understand some of the seriousness, I guess, of what could possibly go on. So I, I talked more about it with my father than I did with my wife. What'd your dad so, say? Ah, uh, he was, yeah, he, uh, he just volunteered to say, you know, I'm here to, if you need to talk or, you know, uh, we can do that. He kind of asked, uh, what I learned from it, um, you know, that kind of stuff, I guess. I don't, uh, father the advice, I guess, kind of, sort mm-hmm. of, in a way, as much as he could mm-hmm. to relate to the job. Mm-hmm. So. How about someone else? Uh, this is Firefighter Jay McManigal. Um, I, uh, called my wife and, Pretty much told her everything over the phone, and uh, she's kind of a softy, so she was kind of she was pretty worried about everybody and how everybody was doing, and uh, she was glad we were all doing okay. Um, she wanted to talk a lot about it and see what the what what happened and why, which you know it's something you can't really explain of why it happened. It's just thing accidents happen, but. Uh, She's uh, pretty supportive about it, and she uh, just wanted to make sure everything was okay with everybody, and everyone was emotionally okay, too. I guess I also have a uh, brother on the fire department, so he called me right away, and, and he's been at our station. So, I mean, I think one of the problems that we have with describing is a lot of people just don't understand where our station is and the correlation to those. The lines that uh, we've been talking about, a lot of people might be, thinking of just like a regular wood pole carrying lines across. This is one of the metal poles that stands, yeah, you know, quite a few feet up in the air. And like I said, the amount of electricity, we're in the industrial park area. So, you know, it, it only knocked out supposed electricity for like 1,500 people. But the problem is it's the businesses that also that are supplied by this power uh, so we have a lot of electricity running through these poles and lines that are up all around our area because of the industrial park. But, uh, I think with my wife too, she just, you know, she had so many things on her mind, uh, with the, uh, you know, home life things that we've been dealing with. And, and truth be told too, I don't always bring home everything from work and discuss that with my wife. It's a lot easier discussing it with my brother who's on the department or with my crew because, like I said, a lot of the things we see every day, uh, we don't always like bringing that home and discussing that with our family. Some of the things I pick and choose just to help help maybe uh, motivate my kids to do a little better or do a little more around the house (laughs) and making them realize how lucky uh, we have it as a family. And with my wife, she's a counselor, so she's counseling kids. And so she knows a lot of these things, and she doesn't need that negativity always. But, you know, I do discuss some things with her, but some things it's easier just to uh, discuss as a crew or with my brother or other people in the department because, you know, they understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't have to give them a whole huge background story before you can even talk about just what happened. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh. Yeah, um, well, I couldn't tell my, I didn't tell my wife until this happened on Saturday in the afternoon. I didn't tell her finally until Sunday night at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, she had gotten home and with the kids and it's just hard. I didn't want, I didn't want the kids to know what had happened because I want to shelter them from that stuff. And so I, uh, I waited till the kids all went to bed to tell her and that was hard. But thankfully, during the day when no one was home, um, I had talked to other people that were calling. I reached out and talked to uh, the um, driver that used to be here at Station 6, where I also used to be stationed before I went to 7, um, has, was a mentor to me. Uh, his name was Doug Meddy, and I reached out and talked to him, and... The funny thing about that was when I did call him, he was at the Green Bay Packers game in uh, up in Wisconsin. So that was interesting in itself. But he was very supportive, helped me a lot. And then other people had called during the day. But when I talked to my wife, um, 
one of the things she said was she thought that uh, she was kind of under the illusion that uh, now that I was a driver instead of a firefighter, that it was going to be a lot safer for me. So mm. kind of had a kind of had a chuckle at that because you know one of the most dangerous places we work as firefighters is on the interstate around accidents like that and mm -hmm. other drivers and uh and i just explained to her that you know i mean even as a driver um you still you know if we pull on different scenes we'll still out act as firefighters too depending on what scene we get called to so there really is no guarantee but just you know shocked a little bit that how dangerous even day-to-day -day activities can be mm -hmm. you know it's so i think that was a little bit of a shock to her but uh yeah, she's very supportive of me and uh, concerned about how everything was going. And I think she felt bad that she wasn't there, but it really wasn't in, in her control. And that was kind of my choice to involve her later as opposed to earlier. So, but yeah, I, like I said, I can't reiterate how much support I've had from my coworkers here in this room and coworkers on the department and everybody. It's just a big family and. That definitely helped when families when family's not around to have that support is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have any of you had a chance to kind of reflect on the the possibility of how the lives of your loved ones would have been changed if circumstances were just slightly different on on this event? In other words, the the outcome would have been a tragedy instead of a near miss that we get to have a telephone interview on um how i mean have you thought about um the impact on your family and and has that inspired you to 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 look at anything differently or to to do anything like you know and i, I don't want to put ideas in your minds but then did, did any of you say you know it's been a long time since i took my kids fishing we're gonna by god we're gonna go fishing now or anything like that well, I'll speak, this is real again. Speaking for me, um, it just uh, makes you appreciate the little things, uh, I guess. And, uh, yeah, um, I guess definitely thought about uh, leaving my, you know, if I would have left my wife a widow with six kids, one of whom my oldest autistic special needs and the stress that would have caused, there's definitely a lot of a guilt, a lot of guilt with that. Um it's definitely made me more situationally aware and just uh, can't take anything for granted, especially in training. It definitely has made me a stronger member of the department because of the support that I got. Um, but, uh, yeah, I uh, definitely put it into perspective for me. It definitely, definitely gave me a lot of thought with uh, how I should do things. And, and, and you know, I've always been a person that just wants to get jobs done, whether I do it myself or not. And, you know, the firefighters are busy checking this and checking that, so I'll just take the truck out and do it myself. And and uh, thankfully now we have that SOP that doesn't allow us to do that. We have to have a spotter at all times. But it's definitely made me aware that, okay, I can't do all these things by myself, even even if I want to help other people. I just I have to get other people involved in order to keep myself and them and other my other coworkers safe. So that's one thing that's really brought home home for me. So I'm going to pass it on here to Captain Cox. Uh, my wife is, you know, she's finally realizing a little more of the severity of this situation when I told her we had to do this podcast. So, uh, you know, I discussed it with her a little bit more, and she said, well, they would have had to put me in a straitjacket because of losing her mom and then her dad recovering. And if this would have happened to me, just all in a month's time, she, she wouldn't have been able to handle it all. And, uh, but as for doing things differently, definitely, uh, just any time that we go on any, just call anytime we step out of the station, uh, I look at things a little differently. Uh, the other thing too, is trying to take stress off of people around me because one of the things, you know, back when I first started on the fire department, we had some captains that, uh, they'd get quite excited, uh, not always in a positive manner on calls, and that would just create a stressful environment for everybody else around you. But if you keep your calm, uh, it just 
everybody operates better. And that's one of the big things that uh, I've really taken away from it is just to make sure everybody's got a level head on, uh, paying attention to their surroundings, knowing that we're all doing this together as a team, and uh, just watching out for one another. And then also for family, I guess, you know, we've had a lot of tragedy lately, and uh, we have been just making uh, every weekend, every moment that we have a little bit more family oriented and that's all, we've always been that way, but just to sit back and realize that we better enjoy these and not just forget these times because we have, we're we having to do that with uh, Carrie's uh, mother. So we have that conversation quite often still just uh, realizing, hey, we're never going to have that opportunity again because she's gone. And uh, a lot of things, our entire lives would have changed if uh, one or more than one of us would have passed away at that incident. Uh, I just make sure I give my kids a hug now, whether they're going to school or whether I'm getting off work. Um, I try to learn from it. I try not to dwell on this incident. Uh, so that's what I've taken away from it. Firefighter McManigal here. Um, I guess mostly you just, uh, when you reflect back on it, you realize that, uh, time is precious and there's, uh, you never know what could happen. It could happen to anyone. It could happen to you. It could happen to me. It could happen to anyone in your family, anything at any given time. So, you just want to take every moment you can with your family and make sure you show them that you love them and how much you care about them. So let's shift to what you all and the department learned from this and then anything that you've changed uh, as a result of this happening. So the lessons learned. Um. Yeah, the lessons learned for me, I know, is like I had said before, is uh, making sure that I don't uh, do things on my own that I shouldn't. I need to be better at asking for help. Um, that would have made all the difference in this situation. Um, having an SOP now that demands you have a spotter when you use an aerial is a huge deal because it really keeps you from doing these things on your own anymore. Um just being aware of my surroundings, the hardest part's been, it would have been easier for me had I hit a power line on a call that I wasn't familiar with on an incident, as opposed to hitting power lines that you know that are there. Um, so it's just being aware, even in the mundane day-to-day -day activities, because those, those things seem to get you before anything else does. I guess up at the station, too, though, uh, I don't know if Tom sent you the pictures. I called Excel, and we've been working together uh, with them to put flags on the lines up there. Uh, and then also this spring, once it gets a little nicer, we're going to actually paint stripes below the lines. So either way, if you're looking down or up, that should be a good indicator to go, oh, yeah, that's right, those lines are there. Um you know, it might seem silly, but another thing, too, we've looked at is possibly just making lines uh, on the pavement, saying if you're going to be setting the apparatus up on that approach, that you do it behind this line, which still, even if it's fully extended out, you would hit these lines, but this is just another way of just hopefully, you know, making everybody aware that this has happened, it could happen again, and also to just seeing those would hopefully remind people on other scenes and other areas that, oh, that's right, this has happened. Uh, one thing we always joke about around our department is uh, when an incident happens, sometimes that uh, something gets named after the person, and uh, so it's etched into everybody's memory, which is one positive is hopefully that everybody will remember this and it will never happen again, and we don't ever have to worry about this again, and hopefully that's what we can take away from this. Uh, as a firefighter, this is firefighter. As a firefighter, I notice power lines now uh, down the alleys of some of the houses, or just the power lines connecting to the houses. I should say, uh, for raising ladders to get up on the roofs. Uh, this is McManigal again. Um, since I still work up at Station Seven, I see these power lines every time I go into work, <laughs> and uh, it just makes me aware that more aware that they're there, and um, helps me realize that. Uh, if there is a 
roving driver out there, or even our regular driver, that uh, probably be a good idea to be out there spotting for him and making sure that he realizes those wires can be closer than they appear. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to note that this happened in the daytime, not nighttime where maybe vision would be obstructed from darkness. Yeah, we had no weather issues at all. I mean, it was a little chilly, but there was no wind. Uh, the sun, was s- sun was bright, but it was a nice, like you said, a nice clear day. There really wasn't any kind of a weather factor at all. Or so. Mm-hmm. Did the department conduct any kind of a formal review of the incident? Uh, as soon as it happened, I actually had to sit down, write it up, what happened, and Tom did also. Uh, and that had to be submitted uh, to our battalion, and then we were just questioning a little bit more about it, but not in a formal manner. Uh, they were really more concerned that uh, nobody was hurt. Uh, but otherwise, really, investigation... They came up when it happened. I went over what happened with our battalion, and he passed that on up the chain of command. Anything else you guys want to add before we close out? I guess the only thing I would like to add is when you were talking about um, had there been a fatality or anything like that, uh, how would it have changed, how you did change things. And I know had things turned and that had happened where there had been fatalities, and I would have been the survivor. There's no way that I would have been able to continue on the job. There's, there's, yeah, there's no way I think about that, you know, and, uh, to be a lone survivor of that type of thing is that's been something that I've thought about. And, uh, that would have really changed my life and changed my career for sure. So, Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I just, like I said, I, I want to do everything I can and my crew does too, to tell this story and, try to keep it from happening to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to try to keep people safe, including myself. And, and it sucks that it had to happen to me, but uh, it's kind of what I've been given, and I'm trying to turn it into a positive. Yeah, you know, What you guys have done here <clears throat> is you've given the fire service a gift, and that is the the gift of sharing your lived experiences with a almost extremely tragic event and you know the, the 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 beautiful thing about having a platform like this podcast is that I can give voice to people who've lived to tell a story you know and, and, and if the outcome would have been different you know this story wouldn't be told and you guys survived and you got a story to tell and you were willing to share the story with the with the mindset that if others can learn from this and this wouldn't happen again as a result of what happened to us and sharing this experience, then the fire service will be made better as a result of, of your willingness to step up. And I, I know that it cannot be a moment of pride to say, well, we're really proud that we had this happen. And, and Tom, you and I had talked you know, before, and it was very easy for me to sense your your um embarrassment about having it happen and how you wished you know that in just the moment you would have um uh, done something different and it wouldn't have happened uh but it speaks volumes to all of you and to your department and to your administration to allow you guys to come on to the show and to share this experience with others because i if if people listen to this podcast are doing what I'm doing. I'm sitting here in my mind saying, wow, wow, wow. (laughs) Wow, was that close? Wow, I would never want to be the one to have to turn to my family and try to explain what just happened here. And uh, uh, I just want to thank you guys so much for for coming on and and sharing these experience, the experience that you have, because truly it is just one of those wow stories of, of, just how dangerous this job can be and how just in a moment's event, just the slightest lapse in awareness can result in such tragedy for us. So 
thanks to all of you for for coming on and sharing that story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Ryan Cox, Fire Apparatus Operator Tom Reel, Firefighter Jay McManigal, and Firefighter John Alvey for sharing the details of your near-miss event, an event that if the circumstances were just slightly different, could have left four widows and orphaned 13 children. I commend you, gentlemen. It takes a great deal of courage to come up, come forward and to share your experiences on a platform like this so that others may learn. Oh, I'm sure there are others out there who won't learn anything other than how to criticize the event. Those people don't learn anything but how to criticize. It's tragic, but it happens. If you've experienced or witnessed the near miss, and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned so that others could benefit from them, please contact me by visiting the SA Matters website, clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the home page. Think about that for a minute. The courage that you display to share the lessons that you've learned from your near-miss event could save the life of another first responder. If you want to share your experiences, contact me. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you or someone you care about works in a high-stress, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we are here to help to improve their safety and survival and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home to the ones who love them. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had some amazing opportunities to present programs on the virtual platform to groups ranging in size from 6 to 400, with recorded playbacks being viewed over 22,000 times. Here's hoping the new year and the introduction of a COVID vaccine will reduce the number of cases and return us back to some form of normalcy for live in-person training. As you will see from this upcoming list of events, things are looking up. On January 20th, I will be presenting a virtual flawed situation awareness program for the Maritime Fire Chiefs Association in Canada. On January 21, I will be presenting a live, in-person, hopefully, situation awareness program for the Utah Fire Chiefs Association in Salt Lake City. On February 2, I will be facilitating the Minnesota Virtual Training Series featuring Kit Welchlin talking about how to deal with difficult people. On February 6th and 7th, I'll pre be presenting three, hopefully live and in person, situational awareness programs at the Missouri Winter Fire School in Columbia, Missouri. On February 8th and 10th, I'll be presenting three, hopefully live and in person, situational awareness programs for the Spring Fire Department in Spring, Texas. On February 17th, I'll be facilitating the Minnesota Virtual Training Series, this time featuring Dr. Chad Weinstein talking about fire service leadership from the inside out. On March 4, I'll be facilitating the Minnesota Virtual Training Series featuring Brian Ward talking about barn boss leadership. And on March 8th, I'll be presenting, hopefully live and in person, Situation Awareness Program for the National Electrical Testing Association's Power Test Conference in Orlando, Florida. On March 16th, I'll be facilitating the Minnesota Virtual Training Series, this time featuring Chief Alan Lewis talking about recruitment and retention. March 23 through 25, I'll be presenting, hopefully live and in person, a Situation Awareness 3 Situation Awareness Programs 
for the Anchorage Fire Department and Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you to the organizations that have allowed me to offer your members virtual training and a special thanks to the 46 agencies who postponed programs in 2020 and are patiently, as I am too, waiting to be rescheduled. <clears throat> if you're interested in hosting a virtual program or a live event, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the essaymatters.com homepage and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check out the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter, how to follow us on social media, and there we share ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 357 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you to my guests from the Sioux Falls Fire Department. And thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.